Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday and welcome. We certainly are thankful for each one that's here. Also, welcome to those who are watching online through the live stream. Uh, thank you to Lowell for leading us in singing this morning, and thank you, Vince, for that good opening prayer. But today we have an elder request, and I love to preach elder requests. I can tell you I think every gospel preacher should love to preach elder requests. Uh, the way I've titled this, a little bit like Seinfeld, I guess, what's the deal with instrumental music? This is one of the most widely misunderstood topics in Christianity today. Maybe you've heard it said about the churches of Christ, y'all don't believe in music. We do believe in music. Vocal, verbal singing is music. Maybe you've also heard it said of members of the Church of Christ, y'all don't like music. That's not true. Uh, we like many types of music. Uh, and of course, we can see this in our worship practices, but you also see it in our personal lives. And I know that myself, as well as many of my friends here, members of the church, we like many different types of music, many different genres of music. And whether you're thinking about big band songs or whether you're thinking about jazz or rock, or ro rock and roll songs, uh, we are selective in our entertainment choices, certainly, but we like music. There are certain types of music that we don't bring into the worship service because it's not authorized. And then sometimes you'll hear a member of the church defend not using mechanical instruments and music, but they defend it poorly. Maybe you've heard a member of the church say it like this, we prefer not to use instruments. Are we talking about preferences? Because if we're talking about what we prefer, then we can do a whole lot of things in worship, right? No, it's not about what I prefer or about what you prefer. It's not about opinions or preferences or likes or dislikes. It's about God. What is his preference? What has he authorized and what has he asked for? The principle is this. We do not tell deity how we are going to worship him. The only reason to do that would be if we had an invented God, if we had a little g God, an idol. Well, if you've got one of those, you can tell it how you're going to worship it, and it can't say anything about the matter. But God wants us to worship in a specific way. And so when we look to instrumental music, what's the deal with them? It's not what God asked for or authorized. It's not something that accomplishes the stated purpose for worship in the New Testament, and it's not even been widely accepted among the denominations until recently. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's begin with this first section. Number one, what's the deal with instrumental music? It is not what God has authorized or asked for in the New Testament. And if you notice, I, I'm very specific here. In the New Testament, you'll find one of the most common arguments used to defend the use of mechanical instruments is that we see them used in Old Testament Worship. We're going to speak about that in just a minute, but let's begin at John 4. John 4, 23 and 24. Notice I'm going to have several words underlined in all these verses that we're going to note here. Uh, these are the words that I believe deserve special emphasis for our purposes here. John 4, 23 and 24. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. All right, a couple of key takeaways quickly. How we worship matters. Every Christian should understand that. In addition, and in emphasis to that first statement, how we worship matters to God. Notice the underlying word, seeking. The Father is seeking such to worship. And Old Testament or New, you'll find this same to be said about God. He is searching to and fro across humanity. He is seeking good and proper worship. There are certain types of worship that he says are unacceptable. And we can read in the Bible about vain worship, about will worship, about ignorant worship. And then, of course, there is acceptable worship. What is acceptable worship? Don't ask your neighbor to find out. Ask the Bible. Worship in spirit and in truth. God is looking for that type of worship. And make no mistake, if our worship is outside of what has been authorized, if our worship is something other than what has been asked for, it cannot be in spirit and in truth. But we like to call things worship, don't we? Mankind. We like to hastily stick the label of worship on something and casually lob it up to God and say, here it is, it's worship, so you got to like it. No. Look to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 12, 31, and 32. This is actually part of the warnings that were given to ancient Israel, warnings not to follow after the idolatrous peoples of the land of promise. Don't worship as the Canaanites worship. And it's important that you understand 
The worship of the Canaanite people was wrong, not just because of what it was directed to, directed to idols, but the worship of the Canaanites was also wrong because of the worship practices that were used. And this is the point that God is making here through Moses. Don't take their worship practices and direct them towards me. There are authorized worship practices, acceptable worship practices, and then there are those things that are unauthorized, even if they're directed to the proper source. Deuteronomy 12, 31 and 32, You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. Okay, not everything mankind labels as worship is accepted by God. Whether you're talking about idolatrous worship practices, which he mentions specifically here in child sacrifice, or as verse 32 broadens the principle, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. So if I have not commanded you to do it, see that you do not worship God in that way. To do so would be unacceptable worship. We do not get to decide, to vote on, or to reason among ourselves after much prayer and consideration that we think something is acceptable worship. If God has not authorized it, see that you do not worship God in this manner. So here's the question. Are mechanical instruments of music authorized to worship God? Is that an authorized mode to use in worshiping God? It's not for us today in the New Testament. But I can tell you that Christians today do more harm than good when they use bad argumentation to try and reason this out. Let me show you a very popular example. I've heard many preachers do this, and I believe it's just laziness. They will open up to the book of Amos, Amos chapter 5 and verse 23, where God there rebuking the house of Israel says, Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. This is a bad argument. You can't pull out this one verse from Amos, ignoring the context, and and say, look, we shouldn't use stringed instruments. No, if you look at the context, in one verse prior, Amos 5 and verse 22, he says, take away from me your offerings. Does that mean offerings are unauthorized, that we're not supposed to have offerings to God? He says in verse 21, that I will not savor your sacred assemblies. Does that mean assembling together is wrong? No, it's bad argumentation. The reason Amos 5.23 says, take away from me the noise of your songs, is because these were a hypocritical and rebellious people who would not follow God's laws, but still tried to worship God and say, oh, we're in a good relationship with Him. God says, take away that hypocrisy. We're not going to take the time to go here, but you might also make a note of Genesis 4 and verse 21, another bad argument that's been used. The first mention of instruments of music is in Genesis 4, 21, the descendants of Jubal. They were the ones who played the flute flute and the harp. And these are listed among the descendants of Cain. Well, the descendants of Cain are wicked, so therefore using instruments in worship is wicked. That is bad argumentation. Don't be so lazy with the Bible. The problem here in Amos and the problem, as you would see from Cain, is about rebellion against God. Don't try and take shortcuts with God's Word. We need to be honest. When you are trying to support the right position with bad logic, that does so much damage. We need to do better than that. Make no mistake, mechanical instruments of music do appear and were used in Old Testament worship. Let me show you a couple. Psalm 150. Verse 3 and 4, praise Him with the sound of the trumpet, praise Him with the lute and harp, praise Him with the timbrel and dance, praise Him with stringed instruments and flutes. All right, now we see here not just the mention of playing instruments, but several instruments are named. Trumpet, lute, harp, timbrel, flutes, and even the broader category of stringed instruments. In fact, as you read through the book of the Psalms, you'll find many in their subtitle will tell you what instrument was played as they were reciting or singing the words of that psalm. Let me show you another text, and then we'll talk about it. 2 Chronicles 29, 25 to 29. We've got two slides here to look at this section of Scripture. 2 Chronicles 29, 25 through 29, and please again pay attention to the underlined words. And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with stringed instruments, and with harps, 
according to the commandment of David, of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan, the prophet. For thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. The Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priest with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah commanded them to offer the burnt offering on the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord also began with the trumpets and with the instruments of David, king of Israel. So all the assembly worshipped, the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they had finished offering, the king and all who were present with him bowed and worshipped. Okay, I want you to notice a couple of things with me. We see this as being commanded by God. Now, it's also interesting in this context, you see them referred to as the instruments of David. And I can tell you different people have argued and kicked around the idea, is this something that God originated or something that God allowed and then command from David's own mind? Whether or not that is the case, notice again, we have instruments specifically mentioned. God says who's going to play them, and God says when they're going to start and stop playing them. Notice also how the entirety of the use of mechanical instruments is connected to sacrifice. When the sacrifice is finished, that is when it is consumed, we see this stop. This is really tied to, in every way, the Law of Moses system, the Old Testament sacrifice system. Now, we've looked at these verses from the Old Testament showing instruments, and you say, what's the problem? The problem is we don't live under the Law of Moses system. We don't live under this Old Testament system with Levites or priests from the tribe of Levi with burnt offerings and sacrifices being made for the people. That is not the law we are under. Now, I want you to hear this very clearly. When someone today uses the Old Testament as their authority to defend the use of instruments, they are making the admission that they are not found in the New Testament. They are making the admission that we don't have New Testament text that says, use the instrument, that I'm authorizing, that I'm asking for a mechanical instrument. It's not there in the New Testament, and that's why they go to the Old Testament. Also, notice this. In the Old Testament, when we see them used, as Second Chronicles says, thus was the command of the Lord, God didn't say, sing, and then the people said, all right, I'll go get my instrument. No, he said, sing and play. He told them what to play. He told them who was playing, and he told them when to play. God knows how to ask for these things. God knows how to ask for what he wants. And if you want to worship with instruments today because David played them or because it was authorized in the Old Testament, then you need bulls and goats to sacrifice. You need a separate priesthood. You need a temple or at least a tabernacle to use. You can't take one part of the old law and bring it over into the new system. You must keep all of the law. And we don't have time to go here, but for your notes, Colossians 2.14, also Ephesians 2.14 and 15, and Hebrews 9.16 and 17 show the old law is truly ended. That's Colossians 2.14, Ephesians 2.14 and 15, and Hebrews 9.16 and 17. So those who want to use the Old Testament as their authority for Christians in the New Testament using instruments, they don't understand the separation between the old law and the new. They don't understand that Christ fulfilled the old law and took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross, that these things are blotted out, and we cannot use them for authority today any more than we would try and use the old law to justify me bringing a goat up here and killing it and burning it before you all today. Clearly, that is not what God has asked for us to do in this age. Similarly, people want to point to heaven and descriptions of heaven found in the Bible as a way to defend. Now, the argumentation is much the same. Let me do this very quickly. Revelation 5 and verse 8, the elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp. Revelation 14, 2, and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. Revelation 15, 2, those who have the victory are said to be having harps of God. Okay, instruments do appear in Revelation in descriptions of heaven. You have to realize what type of literature we're reading here. Revelation is a book of symbolism, and the book of Revelation leans heavily, let me say it again, leans heavily on the typology of the Law of Moses, on pictures of the Old Testament period. Don't be fooled. Okay, Revelation 5, harps are there. You know what else is in Revelation 5? Incense, chapter 5 and verse 8. What about Revelation 14? Harps are there. What else is there? A literal 144,000? No, not to be taken literally. And an altar. Revelation 14 and 18 has an altar there. 
where more sacrifices are being made. Revelation 15 and 2, there's harps there, but in 15, 5 through 8, what do we see? A temple. You and I don't go to a temple to worship. We understand the New Testament period, God dwells in the Christian. There is a difference here. Now, these symbols are being used, a lesson is being taught, but we wouldn't take the symbols and try and literally put them into our modern worship here in the New Testament period in the Christian age. What we need to do is understand how the Bible authorizes. And very specifically, very pointedly, we need to understand biblical silence. What does biblical silence mean? Well, there are certain things that God authorizes, certain things that He asks for. When He authorizes something, when He asks for something, He doesn't then have to go through an exhaustive list of all the things He doesn't want or all the things He doesn't authorize. He tells you what He wants, and that's the end of it. That's the only thing that's authorized. Everything else is out. Of course, we can look to Nadab and Abihu to understand this. It's a classic example provided in the text, Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now, the word profane, as we use it, means just the opposite of pious. To be pious is religious. To be profane is irreligious, or to look at something religious and make it common, uh, to treat it as not religious, not devoted, or holy. Uh, many versions of the Bible here, instead of profane, will put the word strange. It is strange fire. And if you look to the Hebrew term, it does mean to turn aside, to be a foreigner. And it is even used in some senses to describe adultery. And so it is outside what is authorized. It is outside what is asked for. And notice there at the end of verse 1, which he had not commanded them. This fire and the way they obtained it and the way they offered it was not according to the pattern. It was outside what was authorized and what was asked for. We've got a beautiful example of biblical silence and how it should be understood in Hebrews chapter 7. Here you can see the Hebrews writer picking up on an argument that really started back in chapter 5. He's talking about Jesus as the perfect high priest. And there's a big difference, not just between Jesus and priests like Aaron, but there's a big difference in understanding the change of law. We're talking about a new covenant system, the new law, the law of Christ, not the old covenant system, not the law of Moses. As we already saw mentioned in 2 Chronicles, the priests were from the tribe of Levi. Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi. And that's the point that's being made. Hebrews 7, 12 to 14, For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. No priest come from Jesus' tribe. Look at 14. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses, notice it, spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. What Moses spoke, what God gave to the Israelites for the law of Moses, said the priest come from the family of Aaron. They were the Levitical priesthood, part of the Aaronic system from Aaron. God didn't have to say, don't bring me any priest from Manasseh. Don't bring me any priest from Reuben, from Benjamin, from Gad, from Simeon. He didn't have to do that. When he said, from Levi, that excluded all others. So the point is this. Silence does not give permission. It prohibits. Silence forbids. And we understand this in our daily life very easily. If you hired a contractor to build a deck on the back of your house, and you come and he finishes the job and he hands you a huge bill and he shows you the deck that he put on the back of the house and also some things he did in the front of the house, would you be pleased with that? Say, no, I didn't ask for this. You didn't tell me not to. That's a problem. The kid sent to the store with money from his mother, told to buy milk, bread, and eggs. He comes back with milk, bread, eggs, and cookies. You didn't say not to get cookies. Silence does not give permission. That grocery list doesn't have to contain everything in the store that you don't want. You ask for what you want. You are authorizing the purchase of select items. Everything else is automatically excluded. Biblical silence. We need to understand this principle. Uh, we'll hit a little more on that in just a minute. Big number two. What's the deal with in instrumental music? It's not able to accomplish the stated purpose for music in worship. And I believe this is one of the most important 
lessons for us to grasp as we're trying to understand music in the New Testament worship that God has authorized and asked for. Mechanical instru instruments of music are simply not able to accomplish God's stated purpose for what we're doing when we assemble together to worship Him. And this is where we're going to bring in those texts in the New Testament that describe singing in the assembly, that describe singing in the New Testament age. And what we're going to do, we're going to pull out and notice the action words. Okay, we're going to pull out and notice the action words, and we'll have them underlined. First, a section from Ephesians, Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Okay, now we have here at the bottom the Greek word solo. It's a form of that word that's translated in the New King James as making melody. And before we finish our list of action words, we do have to spend a little bit of time talking about solo and talking about making melody. Now, a form of this same Greek word, solo, appears five times in the New Testament. Three times it's translated as sing, one time it's translated as sing psalms, and then one time, as we find here, it's translated as make melody. The word solo has had many different meanings through the life of this word and of the Koine Greek language. It means to pluck, to twitch, or to twang. This can be used to describe plucking a hair. It can be used to describe plucking a string like you might on a harp. It's also used to describe the twanging uh, of a chalk line when you snap it down to make a mark uh, as you're going to work with your tools. But by the time of the New Testament, this word is only used to describe singing. It's only used to mean singing. Now, there are those who today will argue from solo that mechanical instruments are authorized. What they're not doing there is seeing how the word was used, not just in the language, but in the time period. You and I are aware that words over time within a language can change meaning. One of the songs that I learned as a boy, maybe you learned it and you're familiar with it, When Johnny Comes Marching Home. Uh, it's a song born out of the American Civil War, When Johnny Comes Marching Home Again. Towards the end of that song, when the soldiers return, we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. Now, if you tried to understand the words of that English song through the modern usage of the word gay, you'd have a misunderstanding, wouldn't you? You can see you've made a mistake. In the 1860s, the word gay meant something different. That's why it was in the song. You'll find in modern versions of when Johnny comes marching home, it says we'll all feel glad. Why was that changed? Because the word gay doesn't mean today what it did then. In the same way, if someone today in 2021 goes to the movie theater and they come out and they text you and say that was an awful movie, are you going to assume that they liked it, that it was awe-inspiring? Well, no, the word awful has changed meaning, not to inspire you with awe, but to say, this is really bad. The word naughty, this is a new one that I learned as I was doing some research on changed words. When we hear the word naughty today, it means someone is misbehaving, something's bad and maybe even a little bit scandalous. Originally, this was a word used to describe a poor person, someone who's needy. Why? Because they have not. They are naughty. Words change meaning. All right, let's talk about the word solo. The history of the Greek language extends back about 15 centuries before Jesus was born of Mary. And so it's a long-lived language by the time you see Jesus on the earth. In the classical period of the Greek language around the time of Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey, the word solo is used of mechanical instruments to touch sharply, uh, to pull, to twitch as you would a harp. Now, through the passing of centuries, you eventually get to the time when the Septuagint was written. That is the of the Old Testament books. Now, by that time period, which is about 300 B.C. loosely, the majority of the usage of solo is about singing. It still used a little bit of, instru uh, of instruments, but the majority of its usage is about singing. Then fast forward 300 more years. Okay, now we saw words change just from 1860 to 2000, right? 
We're talking about 300 more years after it's already seen a rapid change to be a majority of vocal, verbal singing. Now to the time of Christ in the days of the New Testament, solo is used exclusively of human singing, of the voice. Now here's a fun fact. If you're picking up a Greek dictionary to try and understand the word solo, every single one will give you this distinction. One that I use a lot, Thayer's. It will give you every definition of how this word has been used. And then there in the notation, part of the definition for solo, it says, in the New Testament, to sing a hymn, to celebrate the praises of God in song. Why is that phrase in the New Testament there? To tell you that by the time you come to the writing of the New Testament, this word is understood differently. To no longer be used talking about plucking a hair or snapping that carpenter's chalk line or talking about playing a harp. It is exclusively used of singing. So that's Thayer's. Strong says to make melody or sing psalms. Vines says in the New Testament to sing a hymn to sing praise to God. The analytical Greek lexicon, AGL, in the New Testament to sing praises. Abbott and Smith, in the New Testament to sing a hymn. Moulton and Milligan, vocabulary of the Greek New Testament, in the New Testament to sing a hymn. And they even get reference there to James 5... 13, is any Mary let him sing psalms. Let me make one more mention. In 1911, the professor of Greek language at Harvard, uh, a man who I believe had no reason to try and defend vocal verbal music exclusively in the church, he declared after examining a plethora of secular and religious, religious historical documents that there was not a single example of solo ever used in the time of Christ that involved or implied the use of a mechanical instrument. Rather, it always meant to chant or to sing religious hymns. Now, if we were unsure about that, or if we doubted every single Greek dictionary and Greek scholar, all we would have to do is look at how this word is used in other places in the Bible. Make a note of 1 Corinthians 14.15. 1 Corinthians 14, 15, because if you're using solo as your defense, as your argument for instruments in worship, then you must, you must say that solo always means to play an instrument or always allows for that. Well, 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing, I will solo with the Spirit and I will also solo with the understanding. And in the context there, talking a little bit about speaking in tongues, the emphasis is on communication. The emphasis is on language. You cannot communicate thoughts and ideas without words, without what is vocal and verbal. And so since solo in 1 Corinthians 14 could not possibly refer to the instrument, there is no reason to come to Ephesians 5 and say that it must. Let's make a few additional points. If solo means to play, if, if, ever, if everyone else is wrong about this, and solo means to play, then looking at Ephesians 5, every member of the Lord's church is commanded to sing and to play. Which is scary, not just when you think of the cacophony of noise that would be in the auditorium, but consider this. You would not be qualified to worship God until you learn to play. You would be hindered. You would be unable to worship God properly until you learned a skill, until you learned that talent. Can you imagine someone trying to say such? Now, in the Old Testament time period, when it's commanded, you had a select group from the priest, from the Levites. You can train that select group. They wouldn't even be a priest until they reached a certain age. They would be trained in these things and have time for these things. But in the New Testament, are we really saying it's not enough to know the plan of salvation and know how to obey the gospel and want to be obedient to Christ the rest of your days? Hold on. You can't worship God yet. You need to go take piano lessons. That's a problem. Consider something else. If solo meant to play a mechanical instrument, and that's what Paul intended when he wrote Ephesians 5, guided by the Holy Spirit, why is it that no one claiming Christianity touched an instrument for about 600 years. See, that's another way we can understand words. Maybe it's different to us in our time period, but how did the people contemporary to the writing understand it? If everyone then knew that Solo meant to play an instrument, which is the way people argue this, why didn't they do it? 
And then why didn't he rebuke them for not doing it? If he says, sing and play an instrument, why didn't he rebuke them for not doing it? Because every historical record we have shows that the instrument was not brought into Christian worship. We'll talk more about this later. Was not brought into Christian worship until about six centuries after. How did they understand it? They understood it as singing. Now, notice as you're reading and looking at the action words here, verse 19 says, singing and making melody. And so we are singing, but then we have this term, solo, that is used, and we consider making melody in the New Testament to mean singing. So we have an added emphasis. You are singing, which is ado, where we get adoration. You are singing, and you are soloing, singing praises in your heart. Isn't that significant? Because the usage of solo throughout the centuries, it's always got an object with it. When it means to pluck, you see mentioned there the hair. When it means to twang, you'll see mentioned there the string of the harp. To twitch, well, it mentions the chalk line. Well, if you take the meaning pluck here with solo, if it somehow retained that, look, we have a direct object again. And it's not like the Old Testament where it said, I want the lute, I want the harp, I want psalteries. No, what's here? Your heart. Make melody in your heart. Let's look at some more action words. The sister passage is Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Uh, now that first phrase, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, really helps us understand Ephesians 5.18, the Spirit dwelling in you. It's about the word and working through the word and working within God's authority. But what are the action words? Teaching, admonishing, singing, and giving thanks. Let me include one more and then we'll bring this together. Hebrews 13, 15. This is one of my favorites. It's not often mentioned when you're talking about instrumental music, but it's one that has to be brought into the conversation. Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So the action words we see here are praising and giving thanks. But notice, what is God authorized? What has God asked for? The fruit of our lips. What is produced by the human mouth. Okay, bring the action words together. We noted these in the passages in the New Testament that describe music in Christian worship. It is to be teaching, that is to provide instruction, to instill doctrine. It is to be admonishing, that is a reminder, to put in mind, to give a warning or a word of caution. It is praising, that is to extol, to honor, or to commend one. It is speaking, and that is to proclaim something, to utter words, and that's where we say verbal, not just vocal, but verbal. See, it would be vocal to hum or to whistle or to do the empty vocalization, the oohs and ahs. But in order for it to apply to speaking, it has to have verbs. That's have words. Okay. Uh, singing, verbal, vocal music, or praise. And then giving thanks, of course, is gratitude or agreement. And that would be the difference in the two passages. In Ephesians 5, it's a form of Eucharisto, which is giving thanks. And then in Hebrews 13, it's homologeo, which is sometimes confess or agreement. Now, look at this list and notice what's not on it. When the New Testament gives God's stated purpose for music and worship, you do not find entertaining although we do enjoy worship. You do not find sounding pretty, although we do appreciate the beauty of our a cappella singing. It doesn't say drawing people in. It doesn't say showcasing talents. Guys, that's a lazy argument too. We've got a lot of talents that are not suitable for worship. We have members in this congregation who are very skilled in cooking and baking. We have skill, uh, skills in this congregation in ping pong, golf, Video games? Are we about to bring those things into worship? Now, I'll mention this. All those talents, all those skills can be used in evangelism, in edification, in benevolence. They can have a tie. They can be useful in that purpose. But God would say, see that you do not worship me in that way. I've not authorized it. I've not called for it. And notice this too. Instruments have been around for a long time. Like we said, the first mention is in Genesis 4. They were popular. They were readily available but they were not asked for by God. They were not authorized, and that's because they did not meet the purpose. 
Think about some of the songs that we sing, even the simple ones. Jesus loves me. Now, I can communicate that to you vocally and verbally, but how could I communicate to you that Jesus loves you with a piano? I can never do it. If I trained, I could play something on a piano that sounds lovely, but it wouldn't communicate the idea that Jesus, the Son of God, loves you and did something for you that you could read about it in the Bible. Think about what can wash away my sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's instruction, right? And that's important instruction. I can communicate that to you with words. I could never tell you that the blood of Jesus will wash away your sins on a harp. I couldn't do it. What about words of warning? We sometimes sing, oh, do not let the word depart and close your eyes against the light. That's an important warning. I couldn't communicate that with a trumpet. I can only do it with the fruit of my lips. I can only do it with vocal, verbal singing where I'm communicating these ideas. The word of Christ is dwelling in me. I'm being filled with the Spirit when I communicate this truth. Now, another defense that's given, they say, yeah, John, the the instrument can't do that, but it's an aid to what you're singing. So you're communicating that, and then the instrument aids you in communicating these lessons. All right, let's talk about aids and additions. Could it be that instrumental music is merely an aid? Well, we need to define our terms. What is an aid? Something that would assist in accomplishing the stated task. So God told Noah, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Aids would include tools. He would use a hammer, a saw, ropes, and pulleys. Those things would be required, would be necessary, and would certainly help accomplish the task. Not a different task, but it would have that production, that result of making an ark. Okay, God gives the command, preach the word. There are a lot of aids to preach the word. A microphone is an aid to preaching the word. A radio tower can be an aid to preaching the word. The internet can be an aid to preaching the word. What about this do in remembrance of me, talking about partaking of unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine? This table is an aid to that. The uh, pre-filled communion sets, wafer and juice sets that we have there in the back, those little plastic things with the seals, they are an aid to fulfilling that command. When we sing, we have songbooks with lyrics, with notes in the books. Song leaders may choose to use a pitch pipe. I believe Lowell played one a couple of times this morning. We may even use a projector to project the notes and the words of the song up on a screen. Those would all be an aid. Now let me tell you this. Be careful to follow me. Don't leave what I'm saying here. That pitch pipe is okay so long as you use it properly. And if you notice, the song leader who uses such properly will play a note or two to make sure he can pitch the song where he needs to, and then he sets it down or puts it in his pocket, and then we together... Sing. If you get on that thing and start wailing on it like it's a harmonica, you got a problem. Now you're still listening carefully, aren't you? It would even be all right to use a piano to find the pitch of the song. Now I'm not talking about a piano accompanying the singing during the song. I'm talking about playing the note where we're going to start the song And then we sing the song. Because there it's being used as an aid rather than an addition. Let's go through our examples again. An addition changes the product, changes the result of our action. So God says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood to Noah. What if he used gopher wood for the majority, but in parts he had other varieties of wood? Clearly that's an addition. He's gone outside what God has authorized or asked for. God says, preach the word. What if I preach the word, but in addition to it, I want to use as authority the tradition of the rabbis or the the books of the Gnostic Gospels or maybe the Mormon's Pearl of Great Price? Can't you see those are additions? Very clearly. What about the Lord's Supper? Unleavened bread and fruit of the vine plus peanut butter and jelly plus pizza? And here's a more fitting example, not so silly, roasted lamb. Do you know when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, roasted lamb was there on the table? He didn't use it. In fact, when you think about the symbolism there, he's the lamb. And so it's very important that we're careful with the Bible. When we're singing, we have vocal, verbal music, but it would be an addition to add 
Music of a piano, music of a guitar, a tambourine, drums, or humming, clapping, whistling, empty vocalizations. All these things are a different type of music, a different and competing result, because then you have the voice, which can accomplish those action words, and then noise competing with that voice. Now let's move into this last point. We're going to do so quickly, don't worry. What's the deal with instrumental music? It has not even been widely accepted by denominations until recently. Now understand, I'm not using what I'm going to present here as my authority. I think we've already laid out my authority from the Bible, but this is just to correct some misunderstandings that are out there. You see, a lot of people have the idea that instruments have always been used in religious services, but then the Church of Christ and a few other groups got offended at them and put them away. No, actually, we see in Christianity, at the beginning, no one used instruments in worship which is interesting because both Jews and Gentiles used them in their previous religious devotions. But once they became Christians, they put them away. And then for about six centuries, no one Christian touched the instrument in worship. And then when they did start to introduce these things, there was a lot of protest among Christian leaders and Christian groups who were very upset at this departure from God's authority. Let's consider the word acapella. Uh, now, what we presented on the side there in the script, that's the way we spell it in the English as one word, it comes from the Italian, which would be two words and two P's and two L's. But what does a cappella mean? Well, when you hear an a cappella group today, they just use their voice, right? They don't use instruments. The word a cappella means in the style of the chapel. You can see the Italian word for chapel, cappella, is used there. And what this word means, a cappella, it is music performed by a singer or a singing group without instrumental accompaniment or a piece intended to be performed in this way. Along with this, we note that there is no reference to instrumental music in early church worship in the New Testament or in the worship of churches for about six centuries. Now, I want to bring in some quotations here, and I want you to note, uh, I'm trying to be very honest and fair. I'm not trying to attack anyone here. The first comes from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Now, this isn't what John says about Catholics. This is their own work, volume 10 of the Catholic Encyclopedia, which covers much of the letter M. Part of this is the section on ecclesiastical Music. It's just before the section that actually goes in fuller detail on instrumental music. But this is from the Catholic Church, and this is with their backing. I've pulled these quotes from different places, so I'm jumping around in their text, but this is from them, okay? Although the music proper to the church is purely vocal music, music with the accompaniment of the organ is also permitted. Now, isn't that an alarming statement? Something is proper, but we're going to say something else is also permitted. Therefore, you're permitting what is improper. Okay, the next one. The first Christians were of too spiritual a fiber to substitute lifeless instruments for or to use them to accompany the human voice. And then we have some specific time stamps. I think this is very interesting. Clement of Alexandria. Now, Clement was born about 150 A.D., died about 215 A.D., someone very close to the time of the writing of the New Testament. Clement of Alexandria severely condemns the use of instruments even at Christian banquets. And then another time stamp further in time, the Carlovingian times. Uh, now, sometimes you'll see that referred to as Carolingian. We're talking about the reign of Charlemagne, Holy Roman Empire. So in Charlemagne's times, however, the organ came into use and was until the 16th century used solely for the accompaniment of the chant. Okay, so Charlemagne lived, uh, he, he was born about 742, lived until the, the 800s, mid-1800s, uh, sorry, mid-800s AD. Um, so the organ began to be used in the time of Charlemagne. The first organ was invented by the Greeks in about 300 B.C. So they've had this thing. They've had the organ. And like we said, instruments have been around since Genesis 4. But the Catholic Encyclopedia will tell us that it wasn't until the seven or 800s that we see the organ there really prominent. Now, other instruments there for, first, but the organ very prominent. Okay, one more here. That vocal music is in general more expressive than the mechanically produced tone of instruments is undeniable. 
Okay, now, please understand, if someone is a member of the Catholic Church, if someone is a leader in the Catholic Church, I would say to them the same thing I'm about to say here. If such is undeniable, and I believe that's the case, let's please worship God in the authorized way that He has asked for. Let's do that together. Let's be pleasing to God together. And here in their own works that they promote, that they look to, these things are present. Okay, a couple of quotes quickly. Thomas Aquinas, in the 13th century, he was a Catholic priest. He said, Our church does not use musical instruments as harps and psalteries to praise God with all that she may not seem to Judaize. Okay, the Jews, in their previous religious devotions, used instruments, but Christians did not. Flash forward to John Calvin, the time of the Reformation in the 16th century. Musical instruments in celebrating the praise of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting of lamps, or the restoration of other shadows of the law. Now, I'm going to disagree with Calvin on a whole lot of points, but he's right here. Don't bring those shadows of the old law to New Testament worship. Martin Luther, in the same time period in the 16th century, he described the use of the organ as an ensign of Baal a rallying cry that worshipers center around for idolatrous worship. John Wesley of the Methodist Church in the 18th century, I have no objection to instruments and music in our chapels, provided they are neither heard nor seen. Uh, He makes a good point there. And then last one, Charles Spurgeon, a very famous Baptist preacher and writer from the 19th century. He was wrong on salvation. He was wrong on so much, but listen to this wisdom. I would as soon attempt to pray to God with machinery as to sing to Him with machinery. That shows an understanding of the song service. It shows an understanding of worship. It's about communication. And you remember, we referenced 1 Corinthians 14. I will pray with the Spirit and pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit and sing with the understanding. I can't teach and admonish and praise God for His attributes and what He has accomplished with the vibration of a string or a drum or any mechanical instrument. I can only do so by communicating these ideas vocally and verbally, just like I wouldn't try and pray to God by drumming on this pulpit. I wouldn't try and pray to God with a piano composition. I pray to God with my words. And so when we talk about instrumental music... Is it just a a hang-up and a hobby horse from stodgy old folks in the COC? (laughs) It's really not. What's the deal with instrumental music? It's not what God authorized or asked for in the New Testament. It's not able to accomplish His stated purpose for worship. And it's not even been widely accepted by denominations until very recently. Please, let's be honest with the Bible. Let's be careful to do things properly because as we noted from the text... It matters how we worship. It matters to God how we worship. He is seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. And when we bring what is unauthorized, what is improper, and what is unable to accomplish the purpose, that is not worshiping in spirit and in truth. And it shows a disregard for authority and a misunderstanding of biblical silence. Let's get back to the truth on this and every issue to follow in God's way. If you are subject to the Lord's invitation, if you've never put on Christ in baptism, or if you're a Christian who has fallen away and gone back to the ways in the world, know that God is rich in mercy. He longs to forgive you, and we want to work alongside you. Let's love God and worship Him properly and serve Him properly together today. If we can assist you, please come as we stand and as we sing.